In our last episode five, we showed exactly how Western civilization was founded, not on Christian values, but on Iranian chivalry, wrongly known today as Gothic or medieval chivalry. The Northern Europeans, old Northern Europeans, linguistically had a closer affinity with Greeks and Romans than with Iranians. But uh, their way of life was certainly much closer to, any, to nomadic Iranians. I'm talking before Christianity, of course. Chivalry was brought to Northern Britain in 175 AD by Iranian horsemen serving in the Roman cavalry, known as Sarmatians. The chivalry of these Sarmatians spread throughout the rest of Europe through their mythical hero, King Arthur. Arthur, in spite of his name, his, his Latin name, of course, was a member of the Sarmatian race. And they brought concept of chivalry and justice and, and, and special warfare and honor and all these to Europe, which uh, that's almost fully accepted. No one, no one doubts that. European chivalry was a code of conduct almost identical to what ancient Persians called Arya, which literally meant noble. The noble conduct of the Persians and the chivalry of Europeans were so similar because both traced their origins back to the Iranian god Mithra. Mithra is an Iranian term, and, and Mithra was always known as the Persian god. So, yes, Iranian influence, Mithraism. Nowhere else. Worshippers of Mithra followed this code of conduct to achieve a state of order called Arta. In fact, according to Iranian Mithraism, our sole purpose for being on planet Earth was to bring about this state of order. The end of all existence, right? I mean, is to maintain order, right? And there are, there are certain things, it is clear what you should do in order to maintain that order and what you should not do. That order was believed to lead to peace and prosperity. This peace and prosperity is exemplified in King Arthur's mythical court of Camelot, as well as in the mythical homeland of the Persians, known as Arianum Vyaja. In fact, peace and prosperity was the sworn objective of Cyrus the Great and every other Persian king. They were the first to recognize that, right? The first to recognize that um, prosperity makes for better product productivity. A prosperous realm, a peaceful realm, makes for a better productive realm, right? So that's, I think, is, is quite central um, to, um, to what makes the Persian Empire different. The same principles that made the Persian Empire great also made Western Europe great. In other words, two of the greatest civilizations in history, the Persian Empire and Western civilization, were both founded on Mithraic principles. The word Arta was so important to ancient Persians that it survives in Iran even today in city names like Ardabil or Artakan and in personal names like Ardashir or Ardavan. Even the second month of the Persian calendar, Ordi Behesht, is named after Arta. Arta literally means rightness and nothing served rightness better than order. Within their cosmology, we, re we see reflected this dichotomy between 
order and chaos uh, as positive and negative values. In other words, that which is good is associated with order. That which is bad is associated with, with chaos. But it wasn't just any kind of order. Arta referred to the social order. Social order was ensured through a social contract between each individual and society. We're talking about the social setup in the sense that when you're talking, there is mutual obligation. You have the first step of realizing what it is to have a social contract. This social contract was enforced by the god of contracts, Mithra. Mithra was the first articulation of the social contract. See, the minute you're talking about Mithra, you're talking about a social setup. You're talking about a divinity that ensured the order of society. But right wasn't always associated with social order. Rightness, or arta, was originally associated with the natural order. In fact, the original meaning of arta might be found in the ancient Iranian goddess Aramaiti. Aramati puts arta, which is to say uh, rightness, into physical manifestation. She is a divinity concerned with the regularity of natural forces. She is the regularizing aspect of nature. The regularizing aspects of nature are all the predictable cycles of nature, like the daily return of the sun, the ebb and flow of the tides, or the seasonal migrations of wild animals to the same place every year. These predictable cycles of nature were once the only order in an otherwise wild and unpredictable world. Where can you see Arta the best possible, in its best possible form? In nature, right? The cycles of life and, you know, rebirth and death and, and the cycle, the cyclical seasons, right? That's where the order of society comes, comes you know, it's, it's most apparent. This respect for the natural order had been passed down to the Iranians by their Indo-European ancestors. The Indo-Europeans, like all northern tribes, were nature worshippers. Nature worshipping is, is uh, very much uh, a quality of the Indo-Europeans. Nature worship is when most of your deities are based on natural phenomena, like the moon and the sun and the water and the fire and earth and things like that. Virtually every Indo-European religion had that. The Greeks and Romans and Indians, and well, Indians still have it. The one law that all nature worshippers followed was to live in harmony with nature. Living in harmony with nature meant living a nomadic lifestyle. A nomadic life was spent following wild animals on their seasonal migrations just to hunt them whenever food was needed. The animal that the Indo-Europeans followed was the one native to the steppes of Eurasia, the horse. Horses are the native fauna of the northern steppes, and it, they're very easy to follow. They, they go along habitual paths that are marked by their dung, and you could hide right next to the path, and as they're coming along, pick them off. Indo-Europeans followed wild horses from one end of the Ukrainian steppes to the other, just like their ancestors had done for thousands of years. That is, until around 6,000 BCE, when a strange new creature appeared on the steppes. It was a domesticated farm animal. In Proto-Indo-European mythology, of course, the domesticated animals came directly from the gods to us. Uh, in reality, they came from these um, more advanced neighbors who had moved into the neighborhood. These neighbors had moved north from the far more advanced southern world in search of fresh grazing grounds for their animals. The first culture from the southern world to make contact with Indo-European nature worshippers was the Tripoli culture. The Tripolia culture, which emerged as uh, one of these farming cultures right on the frontier, uh, was uh, the culture that was closest in contact with Indo-European speakers. Their people 
who were quite foreign and spoke completely different languages and were genetically distinct as well. We can only imagine what Indo-Europeans must have thought when they first saw a domesticated animal. Their first question may have been, why don't their animals run away? <laughs> yeah, why don't their animals run away? Well, and you know, these animals, yeah, always came back to their owners. Uh, and then wait to be slaughtered. That's another thing. But it wasn't just the unnatural behavior of their animals that was alarming. The Tripoli people themselves were not nomadic. They lived in permanent houses. Their way of life was a disruption to the natural order and could invite the anger of the nature gods. You have a, a society, perhaps, where fear, in which fear is prevalent, right? I mean, you're, you're at, the, at the mercy of nature and elements of nature, right? And you have people who, who think that supernatural elements might affect their lives, right, in one way or, or the other. The Indo-Europeans would have taken an instant dislike to these farmers, but there was nothing they could do. The Tripoli people were more technologically advanced and soon outnumbered the Indo-Europeans. They were also protected inside large towns. The Tripoli people uh, produced the largest towns that any humans had produced up to that time. They would have 7,500 people in them, four to 500 structures spread over uh, 800 to 1,000 acres. These are large communities. But the balance of power shifted around 4,500 BCE when the Indo-Europeans came up with a technological advancement of their own, horseback riding. The initial use of horses in warfare was mounted raiding. And it doesn't matter that, that they may have larger populations than you, uh, they may be more sophisticated, they may have more advanced technology, uh, living in large settled towns. Uh, you can still destabilize uh, communities like that by raiding them. And that's exactly what the Indo-Europeans did. Around 4000 BCE, a massive raiding party wiped out virtually all the farmers of Eastern Europe. So this event around, say, 4000 BC, was a, a major event in the uh, history and prehistory of Europe. Uh, it was the first time that one of the agricultural civilizations of Europe, which had been there since the first immigrant farmers came in in 6000 BC, 2000 years earlier, it was the first time that one of these civilizations had just collapsed and its settlements been abandoned. Uh, and that probably was uh, connected with tribal raiding by people on horseback uh, from uh, the Ukrainian, what's today the Ukrainian steppes. Finally, the Indo-Europeans could go back to their old nomadic way of life, right? Wrong. When the, the, you know, these nomadic peoples come into the towns, of course, there's something attractive about these kinds of lifestyles. And sometimes they just take what they want and leave. But sometimes they say, well, maybe we'll stick around for a while. Sometimes they settle. Sometimes they establish themselves as the new elite. As the new elite, the Indo-Europeans converted to herding domesticated animals. But not just any domesticated animal, only the cow. They borrowed domesticated cattle because actually they're wild animals, the aurochs, which is uh, wild cattle, that they were already hunting. So domesticated cattle they found useful and somewhat familiar, so they adopted them. Um, domesticated sheep were adopted only later, after uh, hundreds of years of resisting that. This marked the beginning of an entirely new Indo-European culture. Not only did Indo-Europeans convert to cattle herding, they also settled down into permanent settlements. Cattle certainly encourages a community to be more settled. Cattle is something which slows you down, of course. You cannot really move from Taklamakan Desert to Danube and return in one year with, with the herds of cows. The first permanent Indo-European settlement was a place called Sredni Stad. Indo-Europeans make their first archaeological appearance at Sredni Stad in central Ukraine. 
The Sredny Stog culture is a very well-dated culture. Sredny Stog, in Russian that means uh, the middle stack, that's the haystack. That's the nature's name of an archaeological site. There are 10 radiocarbon dates from all around it, saying 4000 BC, 4000 BC, 4000 BC. And its, it's significance is that it is, is the, the oldest you can take to, in the European people. This is the earliest physical evidence of their existence. The benefits of cattle herding simply could not be denied. This may have been the moment when the natural order was replaced by the social order, and nothing advanced the social order better than a steady and predictable food supply. But there can be no social order without a social contract. Law came to the Indo-Europeans for the first time in the form of a contract between humans and society. This social contract, like any law, required enforcement, and enforcement came in the form of an oath called hoitos. In fact, the English word oath comes from hoitos. The root hoitos, which means oath specifically uh, in the Celtic and Germanic branches, uh, is a very old root that goes back to Proto-Indo-European. The central meaning seems to mean to go, actually to walk. It meant to walk because people taking the oath had to walk between two sacrificed cattle in order to seal their oath. Part of the procedure of giving your pledge uh, was to walk between these animals that had been sacrificed uh, to the deities. So that in, in, in making that walk, you were sealing your pledge. So it, it may be that the meaning oath was to walk the walk, how can an oath enforce contracts? The Hoytos oath could, because it was sacred. Breaking a sacred oath carried far graver punishment than breaking an ordinary oath. Could Hoytos be like a distant ancestor of Mithra? Sure, yeah. The god, uh, the, the notion of contract is a very ancient idea and, uh, and word uh, in, in Proto-Indo-European. It's right there in the earliest... Uh, documents that, that have Indo-European words in them. Um, and Mithra is a much lighter expression of this uh, very ancient idea in uh, Indo-European religion and political order, both. Mithra appears for the first time about 2,000 years after Sredni Stock. But where exactly did he come from? We might be able to pinpoint the birthplace of Mithra by following some simple facts. For example, we know that the earliest hymn to Mithra, known as the Mir Yasht in the ancient Iranian holy book, the Avesta, was composed sometime before 1500 BCE. If you're talking about a pre avestan society, because we know, for instance, in the most ancient parts of the Avesta are incorporated in the Meriash, right? You are thinking about a tradition that goes beyond, you know, uh, 1500 BC. We also know that Mithra was definitely born out of a cattle herding society. There is a clo close connection between, between Mithra worship and cattle herding. And that primary place that the bull holds in Mithraic conceptions, I think bespeak a society wherein the bull is an, and cattle, right, is assuming importance. So whenever you date this society to, right, in the uh, pre avestan context, that's where you can trace the beginnings of Mithra worship. And finally, we know that Mithra belonged to a culture that had recently switched from mobile herding to settled herding. In the development of um, Mehr, Mitra it, himself, you can actually trace, right, uh, this development of a society from a nomadic sort of um, pastoral existence, right, to a settled society. Only one culture meets all three of these criteria, Srubnaya. 
Srubnaya was a cattle culture that dates back to about 2000 BCE. It had descended from a much larger cattle culture known as Poltavka. But Poltavka was a mobile herding economy. Srubnaya, on the other hand, had recently settled down into permanent settlements. Srubnaya is a fascinating period because it's really organized differently. Number one, they're, they're, they're living in settled communities. We've excavated one of these sites ourselves and we were trying to look for uh, indicators uh, that they were there just in one season or in all seasons. And we found they were there all year in one spot. Permanent homes. You have not seen that before. Mithra was a god tailor-made for social order, or Arta. It may have been at Srubnaya where Mithra rose to become the supreme god of justice. Just like the Hoitos Oath, Mithra could punish people in the physical world. Mithra's punishment was known in the West as an ordeal. Mithraism had at least two principal forms of ordeal for testing one's veracity. Uh, one was the water ordeal and one was the fire ordeal. And of course, these survived very late, right up into medieval Europe. Uh, and of course, um, they're associated with the divine aspects of both fire and water. Mithra's justice could be harsh. The water and fire ordeals were almost certain death sentences. Describe a water ordeal. Well, you throw somebody in the water and see if they float or drown. If that person has told the truth, then they're going to float. In other words, the divine force of water is going to support them and support their veracity. The fire ordeal was even more painful. You could have molten lead poured into your mouth, or you could maybe walk over hot coals. That could be a form of fire ordeal. But as a god, Mithra could do something that the Hoitos Oath could not. Mithra could punish people in the afterlife. Mitra is also in charge of ensuring justice in the celestial world. And that is why Mitra becomes a god who would appear at the end of times with the scale of justice in his hand to weigh, right? Yeah? When the soul of the departed, right, has to go to the hereafter. Mitra's justice protected the social order from lawbreakers and cheats, but it could not protect it from raiders. The Eurasian steppes was a battleground between two different Indo-European cultures, the cattle herding culture and the cattle raiding culture. The cattle raiders were those Indo-Europeans who had not converted to cattle herding 2,000 years earlier. They had developed into their own separate Indo-European culture, and their culture was war. They were fast-moving gang of warriors. They had horses. They could come and move and raid cattle and then whenever they needed them. And this conflict is very much in evidence in the early Zoroastrian literature that these cattle raiders came on the chariots and the horses and killed and stole the cattle. And, and that refers obviously to the two sections of the same people. The economy of these raiders was almost entirely based on raiding cattle from herders. In fact, wherever there was a herding culture, there was a raiding culture nearby feeding off of it. The raiding culture that fed off the Srubnaya herders was Potapovka. Two powerful raiding cultures dominated the steppes just north of Srubnaya the Potapovka culture and the Sintashta culture. In the steppe zone, uh, you had these cultures emerging. Sintashta on the east side of the Urals and uh, Potapovka on the west side of the Urals. Clearly, they're related to each other. They have almost exactly the same chariot driving gear, the same cheek pieces, the same weapon types, of dagger types, the same grave types. They also worship the same god a war god named Varathragna, which literally means smasher of resistance. Varathragna was a merciless war god, 
a version of this war god was still being worshipped by steppe Iranians as late as the 5th century AD. That war god is probably the most terrifying war god I've ever run across in any mythology I've ever read. He's a really nasty war god, and the Alans still worshipped him in the 5th century by plunging their swords into the ground. Varith Ragna was the same war god that later Iranians knew as Vaharam, or Bahram. Um, Bahram, or Varith Ragna. Yeah, his epithet is brave. Varith Ragna's bravery is the reason he was depicted as a wild boar. The wild boar was considered the bravest of all animals. They hunted wild pigs and they used the tusks of the wild boar uh, as ornaments, as chest ornaments. The wild boar symbolized bravery because it was the only animal that when hunted would turn around and attack its attacker. But bravery was rarely needed when raiding the farmers. That's because the farmers simply paid the raiders not to raid them. This phenomenon was dubbed by Professor David Anthony as a patron-client relationship. In order to be a patron, you have to get clients. Uh, one of the ways to get clients is to go raiding. And if you do that the right way, then there's relatively little violence. There's violence that's required in the beginning uh, in order to uh, put your clients in the right frame of mind. It's exactly the way that the Mafia used to operate. You know, they go and they break one, one shop owner's windows and maybe beat them up, and then they go to the next shop owner and they say, it'd be a terrible thing if something happened to your shop. But if you become my client, I can make sure that it doesn't happen to you. This is how Potapovka and Sintashta warlords became so powerful. It didn't take long for the raiders to take over the farming communities completely. On the east side of the Ural River, Sintashta took over the Andronovo farmers to become the Indic culture. And on the west side of the Urals, Potapovka took over Srubnaya to become the Iranian culture. Srubnaya is derived from Potapovka in the same way that Andronovo is derived from Sintashta, just typologically. Uh, in terms of ceramic types and weapon types and that sort of thing. The powerful war god Varith Ragna dominated the Indic culture on the east side of the Ural River, as expected, and would become the Vedic god Indra. But on the west side of the Ural River, somehow the raiders ended up adopting the god of the cattle herders, Mithra. But not before changing Mithra into a war god. Mithra adopted the warrior dimension of Varathragna. So um, that's where the, uh, the warrior dimension of Mithra comes from, actually. It's, 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 it goes back to this very much more ancient tradition. As a combined god of war and god of justice, Mithra was as brave and powerful as Varathragna, but not in pursuit of cattle, but in pursuit of social order. And that's what made the Iranians different. This social order may have led to the peace and prosperity that Srubnaya came to enjoy. The whole culture seems to have calmed down. There's no real fighting about it anymore. There's also evidence during the Srubnaya period that there's a impressively long distance trade going on. The birth of Mithra marks the birth of the Iranian people. Iranian culture was born of a marriage between cattle raiders and cattle herders. The Iranians would spread south into Persia and west all the way to Europe, but they never forgot the fundamental principles of Mithra. These Mithraic principles drove the actions of Cyrus the Great. But what exactly were the core principles of Mithra? 